scripture of the day is a woman of substance all the way from Pennsylvania State University, Professor Sagan Freant. You're welcome. <laughs> Sitting next to her is another distinguished administrator, Mrs. Olo Ketui, the former registrar of this university. Let's put our hands together for her. Bola Tito Olo Ketui, that's her name. You're welcome. And in our midst today, we have the wife of our vice chancellor, Mrs. B.C. Adeyewa. You're welcome. In the military, when, when you are a general, your, your wife is higher. And so in the university, when we have the wife of the vice chancellor who is a professor, what do we call her? Emeritus professor. God bless you, ma. You're welcome in Jesus' name. And in our midst, we have some uh, other dignitaries. Our deans are in our midst. Uh, the dean, College of Postgraduate Studies, Professor G.A. Kolawale, you're welcome, sir. The dean, College of Humanities, Professor A.O. Adebileje, you are welcome, ma. We have in our midst the dean, College of Natural Science, Professor O.G. Adeyemi, you're welcome, sir. In our midst this morning, we have the dean, College of Management and Social Sciences, Professor I.B. Oloyede. You're welcome. In our midst, we have quite a number of directors, directors, desk, Professor U. Vincent is in our midst. <laughs> Director Drips, Professor Christian Happy, you're welcome, sir. Director Ronsed, uh, Professor A. Adeleke, you are welcome, sir. Managing Director Ron Consort, Professor A. Osho, you're welcome, sir. <laughs> Director of General Studies Program, Professor A. You are welcome, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, also from other universities, we have uh, Dr. Oseyo Ehi Patrick, all the way from Edwin Clark University, is the acting vice chancellor. You are welcome, sir. Dr. Adi is from Federal Polytechnic, Ede here. You are welcome, sir. Uh, as we progress in the program, we will recognize other dignitaries. We don't want to waste your time this morning. We are going to go straight into the business of the day. We want to, I want to call on the Vice Chancellor to give the welcome address. You're welcome, sir. Please celebrate this man. Celebrate him. God bless you, sir. Thank you. The Chairman of Governing Council, our own erudite elder, and who also is the chairman of this occasion, Pastor Tokumbo Adesanya. Other members of the governing council, our mom is here, uh, the deputy vice chancellor, the registrar, and I can catch a glimpse, a glimpse of the former registrar, the university librarian, the university um, bossa uh, deans of colleges, uh, directors of directorates, uh, heads of departments and units, eminent professors, and pardon me, I need to recognize the vice chancellors who have come all the way, who are here, and other members of the community, our great students, and the most beautiful woman here present. And that cannot be any other person that uh, one Mrs. Olabisi Adeyewa. If you know her, just tell her, don't say they said, say I know, because that's the way to get a ticket to heaven to recognize the truth and embrace the truth. Uh, other dignitaries here present. Gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen, it gives us such a great pleasure to be here this morning. We are celebrating the goodness of God in our lives. This is the 10th convocation of this university. And we are just excited that we are celebrating 
this while the body, the spirit, the soul were hale and hearty. And the convocation ceremonies actually started last weekend, Friday, where we had interactions with the dad in the Lord, and then we moved here. Things have been going so well. One of the highlights of the convocation program is the convocation lecture that we are having right now. And I'd like to say this, that the convocation lecture is a very, very important aspect of the convocation program. It is the meeting point between the town and the gown. At convocation lectures like this, we address issues concerning the environment and other aspects of national economy and so on. And during the past 10 convocation lectures, Redeemers University has been in the forefront addressing issues of national relevance. However, one particular area for which we have a niche, for which we are strong, for which we say our Redeemer is strong, is in the area of health. Today, not just in this country, we have been acknowledged as providing solutions, as killing the Goliaths of Ebola, of smallpox, of Lassa fever, and other uh, zoonotic diseases. And it's been our desire over the years that we will speak about this during our convocation lecture. We tried several years ago using our contacts and friends of Redeemers University for run. At the time, one of them had an accident overseas and could not come from the, uh, from the US. At another time, one was engaged from Washington University and so on. Today, I am happy to celebrate a jinx breaker all the way from Cambridge University. It's one of us because we have, I won't say zoonotic, but we have, our DNAs are connected. Because I'd like you to know that we have several collaborators, collaborations across the world. And one of the wonderful ones is the one with Professor Jonathan Haney. <laughs> Professor Jonathan Haney is one of us because it's not the first time here. And he gladly accepted to give this um, convocation lecture. It addresses the health issues of Nigeria in areas of our strength. And I'm happy to note that tomorrow you will say some few words during the convocation ceremony. Now, is it a coincidence that he is called Jonathan Luke Heaney? You know what that means? In the Bible, Jonathan was a doctor. Now, he's more than a doctor because he catches things that are very dangerous. He's a professor of veterinary pathology. He combines so many dangerous degrees. And no wonder today we are having him. Chairman, sir, we would want to appreciate the fact that we have these dignities amongst us. And today, let every ear be opened. Let every mind be opened. Because again, we speak from the pulpit of the academia. And when we speak, the whole world will listen because God has given us a voice. And so today we are glad to have him around. And I want to plead that we'll spread the news. Whatever he says is important. And so we need to spread the news around. On this note, uh, Chairman of the Occasion, sir, I would want to thank everyone for coming and honorably invite the Chairman of this occasion and the chairman of this occasion is no other person than the chairman of the governing council of Redeemers University. If you know what that means, hello, I know you will clap, you will clap with some, um, you know, some, you know, not so cheerful way. But I tell you, in Nigeria today, they have chair persons of councils. And we have quite some in the past in public universities. You know who they are? Some of them are not there because of the university. They are there for themselves, also political parties. 
Here we have somebody who has sold himself out, who would rather give, donate, who would rather spend his time. He's here today because he has to come from abroad to attend this and the convocation lecture. So when you are clapping, you better clap well because you don't give him anything. Sir, you're most welcome for the chairman's address. You're welcome, sir, and God bless you. Thank you, sir. Oh, please sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, please. Whatever Professor Adeyawa has said, or the VC, as you would know, uh, just disregard. Um, for those who know him, anytime you are paying accolades to him or complimenting him, it's actually, he's rather looking down and you would be wondering whether you were speaking to the air because he doesn't seem to listen. So I wonder why he would pay accolade to others when he would not receive. My simple job this morning is just to pay compliment and thanks to Professor Hini for coming. I'm sure a lot of you, particularly the uh, uh, academia here, have left important jobs to come and be educated rather than come to listen to a lecture from a non-lecturer. Immediately I read through the uh, introduction of uh, Professor Heaney, it wasn't difficult for me to, to know the connection and to know how he would come to this village. He's a professor of um, medicine relating to animals. And by the way, let me give a joke. I have a very good friend that um, is a doctor, it's a veterinary doctor. And each time we're talking, we just say, oh, you two call yourself doctor, but you are doctor of animals, not doctor of uh, human beings. But of course, that's speaking from point of illiteracy because the doctor of the animal controls what the, what the man eats, what goes into him. If something is wrong with what you take in, then you are likely, that something is likely to be wrong with you. Prof. Hini, we thank you very much for the humility in you and I have watched you for about five, ten minutes, the way you feel at home. When you talk about the height of English, English class structure, you're talking about Oxford and Cambridge. And there's so great a competition between Oxford and Cambridge Oxford is the first in England, Cambridge, to follow. But in their both races on numerous years, Cambridge seems to, or always seems to be on top. So the controversy now is who is greater? Is it Cambridge or Oxford? When you speak to Cambridge people, they say to you that, Cambridge first. So for a Cambridge man to have come to a humble place, we say thank you, sir. <laughs> the topic today, I mean, I have read through the, the listings, 
I am eager. I am eager to learn. And so, I don't want to take your time as I am eager to learn from, uh, from the professor. So, I will not take time. I will just drop the microphone saying, thank you so much, sir. We welcome you to our humble abode and pray that you'll be able to take some humanity back to the cold weather of Cambridge. Can we put our hands together as we welcome the guest lecturer? Thank you very, very much. I'd like to start by thanking the Vice Chancellor, the scholars of Redeemers University, and in particular, Professor Happy for the warm invitation, the honor of addressing the new graduates, everybody who works here at the university, and most importantly, of course, the graduating class of Redeemers University. Mr. Chairman, kindly permit me to stand on existing protocol. The citation on Jonathan L. Heaney. Jonathan L. Heaney, DVM, DVSC, PhD, SCD, FRSC PAP, is a professor of comparative pathology. He is the head, lab of viral zoonotics, Department of Vet Medicine, University of Cambridge, Cambridge, United Kingdom. <laughs> he obtained his doctorate in veterinary medicine from the Ontario Veterinary College in 1984. After an internship with P Peter Kennedy at UC Davis, he decided to pursue pathology and trained under Ted Valley in anatomic and clinical pathology receiving a DVSC in pathology from the University of Gulf in 1986. Subsequently, he moved from Canada to S.J. O'Brien's lab at the NIH in Maryland, where he completed his PhD on the onco oncogenic transformation of B cells by bovine retrovirus, BLV. He became interested in genetic susceptibility to infectious diseases and stayed on for postdoctoral work with O'Brien, where he studied an outbreak of failing infectious periton peritonitis virus in cheetahs. He then moved to California as a postdoctoral fellow in pathology at the Stanford School of Medicine to study a human cancer caused by HTLV-1, obtaining valuable technologies from the Captry and Herzenberg Labs. After his fellowship in human pathology, he moved to study transplant and retroviral disease pathology at TNO in the Netherlands and became interested in the origins of HIV and the challenge of how to design a vaccine variable and immunosuppressive viruses. He built and established his own lab, the Lab of Viral Pathogenesis at TNO, which grew to become the Department of Virology, where he headed for more than 10 years. After becoming an associate professor at the University of Leiden in 2007, he moved to Cambridge to start the lab of viral zoonotics. The Laboratory of Viral Zoonotics, LVZ, focuses on cross-species transmission of viruses and the co-evolution of viruses and their hosts, including the evolution of immune mechanisms of disease 
disease trans resistance and prevention. Not only has this interest led to the discovery of a number of new viruses, the genetic comparison of host and viral sequences from the same individual and sample have provided powerful genetic tools to solve some of nature's intriguing mysteries. Research in the LVZ is divided into three broad areas, genomics, viromics, and immunity. His studies also focus on understanding successful host immune responses to RNA viruses. Translationally, this information is utilized for the rational design of novel vaccines for the prevention of diseases caused by notoriously variable viral pathogens. Within the immunity program, the lab continues to address the complex issues of immune correlates and to develop strategies to systematically dissect vaccine-induced immune responses that facilitate vaccine efficacy. Current vaccine programs include structure-based vaccine development for HIV and hepatitis C, and rational vaccine design by escape analysis. Professor Jonathan Heaney has numerous publications in high impact factor journals, and his research has, to a large extent, led to the production of vaccines for the prevention of viral diseases in humans and animals. Mr. Vice Chancellor, distinguished professors, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Professor Jonathan Heaney as he delivers his lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Again, as I mentioned, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, it was told to me this morning that I should talk very slowly. That's because I have a strange accent. I don't think so. But what they didn't know is we usually give these lectures in Latin. So I've given you an English translation. Are you ready for Latin? I'm not. My Latin's terrible, so we'll stick with English. How's that? Anyways, in graduating, and this is for the graduating class, you've reached a major milestone at the beginning of your careers. You're about to be thrust into the hard and fast-moving world of today and have the wonderful opportunity to use your minds, the skills, and the knowledge to face some of today's greatest challenges. Pollution and climate change, overpopulation, religious, ethnic and sexual discrimination, war, economics of greed and power, perpetuating social inequality, and of course, then there are the health issues affecting both the physical and the mental well-being of the population. These are issues which I'd like to address today. Now maybe I think most of the young graduates are saying, whoa, hey man, it's not what I signed up for. I've just graduated. This is putting too much responsibility on my shoulders. The problems are just too big. I just want to keep my head down, get a decent job, earn enough money, take care of my family. Okay. Well, let's take a step back then for a minute and ask why they invited some gray-haired old fossil like me to come up here and stand in front of you, tell you about the world and how to fix it. And I, standing up here, thinking, hey, I'm wishing I was down there. Looking up here, thinking I'd have another chance at it. Anyway, again. Well, today I have three simple points, really, and short stories about the following. Dare to dream and that's grasping opportunities and not just watching them come through the window and then exit the other window. Dare to challenge, most importantly, not others, but yourself. And dare to change, to improve things that others say simply can't be changed. So my first, first story is about finding the right path for yourself by identifying that dream about what you want and what you want to be, and then plotting that journey 
to fulfilling that dream. The second story is about challenge yourself, challenging yourself to get to that destination, to climb a higher mountain than you've ever climbed before, to push yourself as you've never pushed yourself before. And the third is dare. The dare is about how to make it happen once you get there. These three dares are the recurring themes in the following short stories. Oh, dare to dream. I wasn't a particularly good student, so I can talk about myself. During high school, I would often find the teacher saying, hey, look at me, trying to get my attention, to pull me back from the subject of my particular dream, that they were there to try to teach me something. And that was difficult because I had mentally gone off on a journey far away, and that journey was my constant consideration of what I would wanted to be, what would be the most suitable profession and the most honorable career. I then tried to place myself in those different roles as a lawyer, businessman, ship's captain, truck driver, ski racer, hotel manager, or a physician. I came to the conclusion that I would probably be a good veterinarian, in part because I wouldn't have to be biased by people's complaints or what they described as an ailment or problems at home, everything else that they tell their physicians. But as a veterinarian, I could simply deduce by good observation and diagnostic detective work what was likely to be the problem. So I'd taken a year off before university to eliminate some of these other potential professions. And I went off to Western Canada. I tried ski racing, professional driving. Sadly to say, I crashed out of both of those with uh, ceremonial regularity. The personal challenges, I returned to uh, address the personal challenges of veterinary school, and these were considerably greater than anything I'd ever experienced before. As I neared my final years, it became clear that I had developed some allergies to those animals that I wanted to treat and the barns that they were kept in. So being a clinical veterinary surgeon didn't really seem to be an option after the many years of study. So then I decided I'd dive into the deep end again, study some more. And I studied to be a, become a veterinary pathologist. That was a number of years of hard work that involved performing autopsies on all sorts of animals, big and small. But because I was a junior pathologist, I was at the bottom of the seniority list, in fact, bottom of the pecking order. So when a dead animal came in, in this, in this case, a dead cow, came into the pathology room, everybody else got on Friday home, you know, to socialize with the families and do whatever they do on Friday afternoons. I got the assignment. So this cow had been out in the field, very hot field, for a long time. If anybody's ever seen a dead cow, they don't stay the same size. They tend to grow in the heat and expand. In fact, I, this cow got so big, I thought it was going to float off the table. So the report from the farmer was that this cow had been acting very strangely. And he thought it might have had rabies. Well, being young, naive, and maybe enthusiastic, I was undaunted. And I enthousi enthusiastically started my autopsy, sharpened my knife, plunged it right into the wrong spot. And because of the high pressure, I got a squirt of blood right in my eye socket. Not too good for a rabies case. Fortunately, rabies is very common. Thank you. Very common in Canada, for which we have good vaccines. And with ours, I received the first of several therapeutic vaccines. 
Years later, I finished my training in veterinary pathology, but that case and several others caused me really to follow those interests in zoonotic viral diseases. So I understand we've got a great diversity of people and interests, and I understand that not everybody really might not know what a virus is. In fact, few of us have ever seen a virus. They're too small to see unless you're looking under an electron microscope. The zoonotic ones are those that are carried by animals and can infect humans and sometimes cause very severe diseases. Examples such as HIV AIDS, Ebola, yellow fever, dengue, Crimean Congo, hemorrhagic fever, and Lassa fever. Many of these are carried by wildlife across all different countries across sub-Saharan Africa. Loss of fever, which I'll return to, is particularly a big problem in Nigeria. It kills thousands of people, particularly farmers in rural areas. And from Nigeria, right across to West Africa, it's estimated to cause over 300,000 infections, and again, that's an estimate, a year, and more than 3,000 deaths. It is endemic and carried naturally by rats, and it is highly contagious. So here, I want to talk about a lifetime of learning, and you've just begun this journey. It's a fast-moving world, and it's tough to avoid continuous learning. Even tougher is to get the facts. The real truth, there's so much fake news out there. I think that's why I became a scientist, really, to get the facts and to understand the essence of what was going on. After getting my degree as a pathologist, I thought it would be, I thought I would finally get tired of learning. That was eight years, two doctoral degrees. But these types of viruses very much interested me. And I thought, as a veterinarian, we should be doing something more about them. After all, there were good vaccines for rabies. I'm a living example. Why could we not develop vaccines to protect us from these more nasty diseases? Back home, we not only vaccinate dogs and cats and people at risk like vets, but we use live bait to drop from helicopters in areas where there's lots of rabies cases to vaccinate the wildlife. Vaccines are wonderful things. Don't doubt that for a minute. They work naturally to stimulate your immune system. And once your immune system recognizes a pathogen properly, you're naturally protected. You might just need a booster once in a while to induce those protective response. You have to think about it like taking yourself to the gym. You want to get stronger, you go and you work out. Well, vaccinating your immune system is, is taking it to the gym. So vaccines are good. So I went off and did a PhD to study viruses in, in the United States. But when I finished, I found that these zoonotic viruses I was interested also caused human disease. I had another academic dilemma. I was a veterinary pathologist. So I went and I spent time at Stanford University in a human pathology department learning more about human disease. And I soon myself found myself in an area that we now know as one medicine, which is the area of overlap between veterinary medicine and human medicine. In many ways, these two disciplines are inseparable. We occupy this planet with animals. We need them, they're good for us, and we should be good to them. They do, however, carry viruses that our immune systems don't recognize. So when they do infect us, sometimes the consequences can be nasty. It's estimated that 70% of human infections have their origins in animals. And this is probably because many animal species 
have lived apart from humans in their own environment or ecosystems. And it is only when that ever-expanding human population has encroached and changed the ecological balance that we see more zoonotic infections. And that's why we're seeing perhaps more than ever. So the term One Medicine has now been replaced with One Health. There are more than just vets and medics involved, and it includes experts from other biomedical sciences, maybe some of you in the future. Those that impact on the healthy balance between animals and humans and their ecosystems. So in the mid-1980s, the cause of AIDS was identified as a virus. We know that the primary agent is HIV-1. And the race then began to find a vaccine for AIDS. However, during those years, many questions arose about the origins of HIV-1 and its cousin, HIV-2. Most of you probably ever only heard about HIV or didn't know that there was other subtypes, but there are. And as you know, HIV-1 has become a global human pathogen. It's gone viral. It's gone around the world from human to human. It has happened particularly, most likely, because it does not cause serious symptoms early in infection, like Ebola or Lassa fever. And it can go unrecognized in a person for up to eight or 10 years. That allows the virus to spread. It's a stealth-like viral infection. And, sadly, HIV attacks the human immune system. And it may take years for that immune system to be crippled and slowly come down to a level where it doesn't work anymore. Hence, the long time to develop AIDS. So it's when the immune system starts to collapse, then our immune system shows us what it's actually doing every day of our lives. Our immune system from dawn to dusk, 24-7, 365 days a year, is protecting us from all sorts of pathogens that we come into contact from the moment we get up in the morning. People with weakened immune systems, in particular HIV infection, often get bacterial and parasitic infections, and they require antibiotics. This brings us to another problem. The widespread use of antibiotics in people who have weakened immune systems is causing a very, very serious concern, concern for all of us here in this hall and everybody out there on the planet today. Perhaps the greatest threat is multi-resistant tuberculosis. I'm looking at someone over there is working on it. Again, other silent killers, TB being one of them, and with this armed with this anti-drug resistance, has taken us really aback and weakened our ability to fight this disease. In particular, HIV now infects 37 million people around the globe. And you know what? 30% of those people don't even know they have it. And they have weakened immune systems. So during the years of the HIV vaccine story, one of the big challenges that we challenged ourselves and others with was where did HIV come from? And why did one type become and go viral and become a global pathogen and went around the world quite successfully. Well, the other, HIV-2, has stayed fairly localized in West Africa. Well, our work suggests that this is, has to do with the virus's origins in non-human primates. So as you know, we're a member of the primate family. There are over 35 species of small monkeys, African naturally, African primates that naturally carry viruses closely related to HIV. In, all, in almost all cases,
these viruses and their monkey hosts are friendly. These viruses coexist with the natural hosts, and they don't cause disease, except when the viruses step outside of these species. The genomic era has allowed us and others to do a lot of detective work by comparing the genomes of HIV, the one that went global, and HIV-2, the one that stayed at home. And the conclusion is, thank you, that's, that's helpful. The conclusion is, by hunting and eating monkeys, chimpanzees became co-infected with different types of monkey viruses. Try to do this seamlessly. It's not, it's not so elegant. Sorry. So, how did chimpanzees acquire this pathogen, and how, in fact, did HIV come adapted to non-human primates? Is this working? Can you hear me back there? Without this, no, not yet. Test. Now we're wild. It's all yours. Thank you. It's terrible when a guy stands up here and talks to himself. He can't hear it at the back of the room. That's going to fall over. So we're, so let's go back to chimpanzees for a minute. So chimpanzees, everybody thought might have thought they're omnivores, but they have carnivore instincts, in particular one subspecies, Pantroglodytes troglodytes, have a particular appetite for monkeys, canopy dwellers, as well as bottom dwellers, and that's where they acquired these two different types of monkey viruses. And it was one particular good chimpanzee hunter that picked up these two different kinds of viruses. And what happened? Well, what happens with many viruses, they reco recombine their genomes. And this particular variant virus grew potentially very, very well in chimpanzees and adapted to a great ape in such a way that it became highly infectious, infectious enough that it could then jump from another species to humans. And it was presumably the bushmeat trade that this virus was transmitted to humans and became the human-to-human -human pathogen we now call HIV-1. In contrast, HIV-2 really never left monkeys. It's already stayed in Sutomangabes. And it's acquired, again, through the bushmeat trade or keeping Sutomangabes as pets. Perhaps because chimpanzees are our closest living relatives, that we facilitated that transmission from chimpanzees to humans so easily. So I've indicated before that unlike HIV, which has a very asymptomatic disease course, there are other viruses that have quite a different outcome. Ebola, for instance, as you know, causes a very acute disease between 12 and 21 days of touching or being exposed to somebody who has Ebola. It spreads rapidly. It's highly contagious. In many cases, without treatment, its mortality rates are around 90%. But historically, although Ebola has never gone global, it is greatly feared. Greatly feared because it is so contagious and rapidly spreads and it has such a high death rate. Well, those of you will remember back in the summer of 2014, there were two separate outbreaks of Ebola, one that hit all the newspapers, and the other one that happened in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The one in the DRC was contained with the larger epidemic happening in Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. The epidemic that was raging out of control was, of course, because Ebola had not been seen in West Africa before. 
There was a big delay because of the confusion of what it might be. Nobody was thinking Ebola. But in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the first case began with a pregnant woman at home who had prepared and eaten bushmeat, a monkey, that her husband had delivered the evening before. Unfortunately, became, she became so ill that the local doctors, not knowing what it was, were quite concerned about her unborn baby, and they pre performed a cesarean section. Tragically, both the doctor and the two assisting nurses died. So Ebola outbreaks happen and begin with humans consuming bushmeat, and that is one of the major risk factors for contracting Ebola, especially in endemic regions, obviously in endemic regions. So let's just go back to that bigger outbreak in 2014, 2015. It differed because it took a long time to recognize it, and by that time, people with the infections had moved and migrated to the large population centers of Conakry, Freetown, and Monrovia. And with such large numbers of cases, I became concerned about the risk of Ebola mutating, doing something that maybe HIV-1 did to become a human-to-human -human pathogen. Could this have been possible? Well, fortunately, this did not seem to occur, at least not in the first instances. But there were some important warning signs. The West African Ebola outbreak had introducing, introduced a very important new dimension. It was generally thought that Ebola patients who survived the hemorrhagic fever, that their immune systems would eliminate any residual virus. Ebola survivors were carefully monitored and the Ebola treatment centers were watched carefully until they re regained full health and then tested twice with blood tests, PCR as we call them. Only with two negative blood tests, 21 days apart, would people be released from Ebola treatment centers. However, things were different, as I mentioned, and what was different were the large number of cases and the variable outcome of Ebola disease survivors. Many people with asymptomatic, when released, developed chronic joint pain, back pain, visual impairment, hearing problems, problems remembering things. So it, clearly, clinically, Ebola disease had had a big impact on these people and people's lives. Accumulating, accumulating evidence suggested that there might still be some virus amongst these individuals. Perhaps not in the bloodstream, but in deeper, deeper compartments within the body. And as I mentioned, perhaps in the eyes, the reproductive organs, where Ebola has been found. In fact, as you may have read, over 30% of male Ebola survivors still have detectable genomes in their semen for more than nine months after they've recovered from the disease. So that means that sexual transmission is possible, that human-to-human -human transmission is possible. In fact, just three weeks ago, there was another report in The Lancet, in a case that I had heard um, and was called up about in Liberia. And a case where a pregnant woman, sister, was taking care of her brother with Ebola. And sadly, despite her best efforts, he died. She lost her baby, miscarried, but didn't develop overt Ebola symptoms. She was checked and released, went home. About a year later, as she was having another child, she was pregnant, gave birth. Things seemed okay, but two weeks later, there was some fever. She took the baby to the local hospital. They were checked out, seemed fine. They found some malaria parasites in her blood smear. 
so they treated them both with malaria, but fortunately, they kept the samples. About four weeks later, her oldest son showed up at an emergency of a hospital clinic with fulminant Ebola and died. Similarly, when the authorities got a hold of this news, they went and it was revealed that the husband, as well as her younger son, also had Ebola. And fortunately, they were successfully treated. But that does indicate that the virus is able to persist and hide in various organs that the immune system can't get access to or clear the virus from. So clearly, one of the greatest challenges to prevent a vaccine that would protect against infection. You want to stop that virus from getting in and being able to replicate, especially in places like the eyes, or the joints, or the reproductive system. Ebola is a member of a larger family called filoviruses. Other members are called Bundabugio, Sedan, Thai Forest, Reston, etc. And it's important to realize that these are Ebola is just one of many different filoviruses. And that means vaccination may be difficult. The use of ring vaccination with an experimental vaccine at the end of the large Ebola outbreak, using a method that came from veterinary medicine, was successful because they were able to vaccinate people who were in contact and contacts who were in contact with the contacts successfully contain that infection and induce protective immune responses. And that was the first evidence that vaccina vaccination would work against hemorrhagic fever viruses. One of the limitations, however, that in that vaccine, they were using an isolate that came from the Kikwik out outbreak more than 20 years ago. And don't forget, these viruses mutate and move on. So. The vaccine works, but it works against a particular strain. The vaccine actually was based on a recombinant veterinary virus, one used in Health Canada's research laboratories, one called vesicular stomatitis. And using that kickwit strain, it was quite successful in limiting the spread of a variety of infections. There's now a second Ebola out, outbreak still going on in the Democratic Republic of China, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And we pray that peace will come to the north. potential to protect people from three different hemorrhagic fever viruses. Our early data in animal models suggests that we can protect from Ebola, Lassa, and potentially Marburg virus. And based on our research and our preclinical data, we have just received funding to start our first human clinical trials within the next two years. Our close collaboration with Professor Happy and his team at the African Center of Excellence in Genomics and Infectious Diseases here at Redeemers University will hopefully bring us a closer step to this reality. So my last point is dare to change. 
improve things that others say can't be changed. So one important reason that it was difficult to curb the West African Ebola outbreak was because of so so social, social practices. And important amongst these was the traditional culture of attending funerals, contacting the body, mistrust of the government, conspiracy theories, and tribal regions in West Africa, of course, crossed colonial borders. Visits to um, affected family members, to funerals, included physical contact with the deceased. These played an important role in fueling the transmission. For instance, the Kissi people have a custom of taking care of the sick family and village members, and even, if necessary, attending local hospitals do the cooking and the cleaning. And the hospitals recognize and accommodate, accommodated such practices, even to the very, very ill. If a person dies within the hospital, traditionally it's important then that the body be repatriated to the village to enable proper traditional funeral. The World, Out or the World Health Organization has then recently advised that these practices should come to a conclusion. So let's turn the page and look at another hemorrhagic fever virus. I mentioned Lassa fever. Again, the WHO described 2018 as the largest outbreak of Lassa fever ever reported in Nigeria. And that's only based on confirmed case numbers. I was fortunate that last spring, Professor Happy took me on a tour of some of the hardest hit Lassa fever regions in southern Nigeria. The virus is transmitted to humans by food or contaminated household items, those that are contaminated by rodents spread, the virus is spread from those rodents in their urine or feces. And in particular, the main primary reservoir of Lassa fever virus is a rat we call Mastomoces natalensis. It is a particularly specialized rodent that expands its population very quickly in times of plenty. It lives amongst villages and farming communities in agricultural areas. And people who are in these areas where sanitation isn't as prevalent are at highest risk. Infection of telosophy by Lassa fever traditionally happens through exposure, either direct or indirect, of animal excrement through the respiratory tract or gastro gastrointestinal tract. Sweeping up rice or cassava or rebagging your grain to sell it on to traders is a particular risk. We know that the aerosol from the urine and the feces from these rats is particularly contagious. So we believe that these risk factors can be controlled. And if we educate and inform the communities of the risk, how they might store their grain or dry it better so that the rats don't get into the food chain. Each year, the number of cases in Nigeria beginning to increase. And again, it starts seasonally in November to February. That brings me to the last dare, dare to change. Can we change practices which can slow and stop this disease? Certainly we could provide vaccines, but we can't deliver them always to everybody or fast enough. Public health campaigns in the most affected community should include strategies for keeping rodents outside of homes away from food supplies, impro improving personal hygiene practices, storing grain and other foodstuffs in rodent-proof environments. In particular, keeping the rats out of communities by disposing garbage far from the home to maintain clean households. Gloves, masks, laboratory coats, and goggles are obviously important if a family member is caring for an infected person. Change 
changes such as those that will prevent infection by exposure. New diagnostics, as such as those that Professor Happy is working on, will help the early identification and safe transport and safe transport of infected patients to expert treatment centers. This disease can be successfully treated if diagnosed early enough. So in conclusion to all of you, I say, dare to dream, dream of important and good changes, change yourselves, challenge yourselves, and dare to change practices to improve the lives of those in this country and in this world. Nigeria is a remarkable country, full of remarkable people with huge potential and opportunities. The new graduates are the next generation of well-equipped young people who can make these changes. Redeemers University has prepared you well, and I look forward to hearing about the wonderful things that each and every one of you shall accomplish in the future. And I wish you and your families the very, very best in the coming years and success amongst your journeys. Thank you. Let's keep clapping for him. Please, you can go. Thank you, sir. Please, we can have a seat. I'm sure you want to put your hands together once again for Professor Jonathan. I want to congratulate each and every one of us for hearing that good news that a vaccine that has potential to protect human against those deadly diseases is being prepared already. There is hope for you and I. Let's put our hands together once again. Thank you for that brilliant lecture. We thank you for coming all the way from Cambridge to us here in Ede. You have had the lecture, and I have the privilege to call on a few of us who have questions. Please, you have one or two questions. Let's ask a distinguished lecturer. We have the opportunity to ask questions. Please signify by raising up of your hand. Number one there, that young man there, number one. Yes, number two. Can we welcome number one while the number two is getting ready? Yes, number three, sir. Tell us your name and your question. Let's clap for him. Young man. Okay. Thank you. Good day, all principal officers in the house. Um, my fellow students, all protocol duly observed. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful lecture. My name is Clarkson Wilcox, and I'm graduating from the Department of Biological Sciences. So during your lecture, you, you stated it clear that um, chimpanzees were carriers of the disease HIV. Yeah. And it was acquired by hunters and it was transmitted amongst humans during the bush um, business transactions and all. Now my question is, how was the um, index case um, documented. How was it? How did it come about? The index case. How did it come about from chimpanzees to to man? And my second question is: Are Ebola survivors immune to the virus? Are Ebola survivors immune to the virus? And so far, is there a potent vaccine for HIV? So these are my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Number two. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Dauda. 
I'm in the Department of uh, Economics and Business Studies. And I want to thank the guest lecturer for your presentation. Uh, I discovered that uh, you dwell too much on HIV AIDS. And looking at the health challenge of Nigeria, challenges, uh, malaria is one of, not even one, is the greatest challenge because both morbidity and mortality rates are very high. Uh, apart from that, we also discovered that uh, the, one of the emerging health problems is uh, the issue of chronic disease. Uh, previously, our health challenge has to do with communicable diseases, but now because of a uh, demonstrating effect, uh, we want to live the way advanced countries are living, uh, we want to consume what they consume. We now discover that issues like uh, cancer is getting more prevalent. So I wouldn't know why you dwell much on HIV is that occupies like, uh, I think the fifth position because the prevalence is like 3% uh, and what have you. So I want you to enlighten us on that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to welcome Professor Komolafe for his question. Professor Komolafe. Mr. Chairman, sir, please permit me to stand on the existing protocols. My name is Isaac O. Komolafe, head of the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, thank you very much, Professor Heaney, for that wonderful lecture, uh, which I enjoyed as a professional colleague. I also want to ask, because you mentioned about the origin of HIV. Now, there are some people who believe that HIV is Africa's gift to the world. Many others, academics, erudite scholars like you, sir, believe that the virus is a product of genetic engineering that emanated from one of the military research laboratories in the US. Now, on which side of the divide are you? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions in the house? So. Let me call on Professor Eni now to answer the questions. Three questions in all, please. You can come forward, sir, to answer the questions. So the first question, the first question was one of three um, about chimpanzees and HIV and bushmeat. And I mentioned that it's been the new genomics era that has allowed us to come to the answers, some of the answers about the origins of AIDS. And it's by looking at the genomes of the chimpanzee virus, the human virus, <clears throat> and all the monkey viruses that we have been able to piece the puzzle together. But again, one of the powers of the genomic tools is that you can date events. We know the rough mutational rate of these viruses. So very clever bioinformaticists bioinformat are able to use this information and apply what we call a molecular clock. And that dates, and of course there's controversies even among scientists, especially among scientists, about then the time of the origin of HIV and when the virus jumped from chimpanzees to humans. There are several papers out there. They're worth reading, a great molecular detective stories. Uh, and there's some dates about when. Was it in the 30s? Was it at the turn of last century? But we know that it happened at least before 1940s and probably was associated, they say, with the colonization and the industrial revolution, in particular in the DRC, or Zaire. 
and that Kinshasa, which was then a big hub, center of commercial activity, was hungry, needing food, and perhaps that these chimpanzees were hunted as bushmeat, came down the river into Ken Kinshasa from where they were hunted as bushmeat. That's the story that people have put, put together based on data from molecular clocks. So how exactly we know, did it occur? Well, we don't know, but perhaps blood contact. We know that HIV is not that contagious, but blood contact perhaps by butchering or hunting maybe led to the first index case. So another very intelligent and astute question was, are Ebola survivors immune to the virus? That's a particularly difficult question because Ebola doesn't many others. So there's never been an epidemic that I know of that has occurred in exactly the same place where the same doctors or nurses have been exposed to high levels of Ebola virus. So it's a very tough question to answer, except to say that if one was in the laboratory, and it's been done in the United States, was to give Ebola to a monkey and then treat the monkey so it survived, there's evidence that those monkeys that have had the disease will be protected from future infection. That has really helped us with vaccine design. More importantly, we know that convalescent human antibodies, or sera, taken from Ebola survivors, can be used to treat other people and help them get through the acute disease. And more recently, there have been monoclonal antibodies that have identified and used to treat individuals. So we know that there's a protective mechanism that is probably mediated by antibodies. So the answer is, will Ebola survivors be protected from future infections? Probably, if it was to the same, stra same strain. The third question is, is there a vaccine for HIV? And I must say, I wish there was. Um, there have been big trials, big trials in humans. Uh, there have been protection that has been observed, but it's statistically low. And people are trying to improve on those observations from those successful clinical trials. But don't forget, HIV is a different beast. Retrovirus, it belongs to a group of families family of viruses called retroviruses, retro because they reverse transcribe their RNA genome into DNA and that integrates into the cells of our immune systems, making it very, very difficult to get clear and get rid of the virus. So a vaccine for HIV is highly desirable, but still it's like the space race or getting to Mars. It'll take a few years. Second individual asked me about malaria and chronic diseases. It's underestimated really how important chronic diseases are. And chronic exposure to malaria or other pathogens are economically a huge factor. And some of them are linked to cancer. Burkett's lymphoma has been associated with a virus that many of us have, but in some individuals at a young age is associated with cancer, probably driven by chronic immune stimulation. And agents such as malaria are thought to play a role. Then there is, you know, HIV. Did, was it invented in the West and set here, sent here to punish Africans? Not sure, maybe Donald Trump might believe it. I. I don't, as a scientist, looking at the evidence, clearly not the case, C certainly um, not the case. So third question, any more 
I think hopefully I've, I've satisfied all the questions that were brought forward. Thank you very much. I'm sure you can do better than that. Let's put our hands together to appreciate him. Thank you so much, sir. If you will forget anything at all, don't forget to dare to dream, dare to challenge, and dare to change. As we live here, we must do better, we must seek change, and God will help us. Thank you once again for that brilliant lecture. Now let me recognize the presence of some other dignitaries in our midst. Uh, Dalian told us that uh, Dr. Oseyon Patrick, Representing Ed, Edwin Clark University is the acting vice chancellor, all the way from Edwin Clark. Let's put our hands together to welcome him. Thank you. And then the representative of the rector, Federal Polytechnic, is in our midst, Dr. Adi. You're welcome, sir. In our midst, we have uh, Mr. Falano. Uh, is uh, from Ede South Local Government. He's in our midst. you welcome, sir. They are our landlord. I want to thank you for coming. Mr. Keshinro O, NSS DC, Ede South, you are welcome, sir. Having gone this far, I want to warmly welcome the Chairman of Council to present a closing remark, but before then, he will do something unique. Sir, I'd like to welcome our Chairman of Council, Pastor Tokumbo Adesanya. Let's welcome him especially with a loud ovation. You welcome, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Professor Heaney, VC, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to have sat here this morning to hear this beautiful lecture. And not just that, the way uh, it's a lecture primarily to the graduating students but he has used his profession, his knowledge to bring down his advice to the graduating students. He's talked about dare to dream, dare to challenge, and dare to change. For my young brothers and sisters that are leaving the university, you have acquired, you have stayed here for a period of time, you have acquired instructions. You have been exposed to the challenges of the society and at the end of it, it's probably a question um, hung on you as to how do we go about it when all these challenges exist. Well, from the lecture of the erudite professor, you have seen how he has gone from places to make a difference. 
He has established labs to address given problems. He has been involved in creating vaccines to prevent existing diseases. And I'm actually, um, it's actually welcoming that he addressed a part that uh, concerns us in this part of the world. I don't know whether he knows that, um, I don't know whether it is, whether chimpanzee is the same thing as the bushmeat. Please, can somebody educate me? But bushmeat is a staple meat in this part of the world. And we know that it's carriers. In fact, we were told during the Ebola period that please stop eating bushmeat. But with Ebola, seeming to have, have, uh, have gone. I don't know whether they asked them that it is now safe to eat bush meat. But it's good to know that cures, vaccines have been made to prevent uh, uh, the occurrence of these diseases. I'm sure the clap is for him and for <laughs> Professor Happy and the people that are involved in this continuing exercise, continuing exercise. To the young graduating students, the challenges that you meet, how do you address? You are going out into the world fraught with all kinds of difficulties. You can hardly get things done the normal way, except to say that maybe normal uh, could be doing it the wrong way. Once I took my son on a drive, we were driving on a beautiful street of Ikoi, and he saw three high rises, imposing high rises. And he said, Dad, who owns this? And I said, it's an admiral. He said, an admiral? I said, yes. He said, how did he acquire this? I said to him, um, in this part of the world, you don't ask how you acquire. You just say you own. But within me, I knew of the difficulties that was within me. This is a boy that I sent to the prep school from the age of seven, he has come out, he came back from England after his master's degree. But of course, each time they were there, I always told him, well, I always told all of them that I am sending you out of the country. I'm sending you to England to acquire education 
to compete with, the, with any, other, any other national. But Nigeria is where you belong. In any other country, you are a second class citizen. Whether you are a professor, English professor in Oxford or Cambridge, delivering a beautiful lecture in Spain, they will still come to you and say, it's a wonderful lecture. Where are you from? So your English, your knowledge, your acquisition or whatever, it's nothing except for here. I am addressing young graduates. I'm saying to you, the system is not right here. But what are you going to do about it? Let me say to you that it is not uncommon. While you see those high rises and you read on a daily basis embezzlement of millions, billions, and so on and so forth. You, one person, one person can choose that I will not do it this way. And it is not uncommon for you to go to public offices and somebody has helped you and you say, please take this gift. And he says, no. No, I'm doing my job. I pray to God that you will be that one person. You need to dare that I can make a change. Thank God somebody from this society, from this place that a lot of you may know, the Vice President of the Republic of Nigeria today, you would say, oh, they, I mean, the government is bad, everything is done, but in the few weeks and the few occasions that he had had opportunity, he had made a difference. So to you, my young brothers and sisters, this had been a wonderful lecture for us and I challenge you to go out dare to dream dare to challenge you must never accept given situations oh corruption exists everywhere look at you can choose not to be engaged and by that you may have achieved a difference. You would have achieved a proper change. God bless you. <clears throat> Professor Heaney, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture that you have given in acknowledgement that you have become one of us. I have the honor to bestow on you this medal. You are invited, sir.
I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for this unexpected honor. And it's been a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we are gradually getting to the end of this program. But before then, I want to invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor as he gives the vote of thanks, Professor K.S. Ike, as he gives the vote of thanks. Let's keep clapping for him until he gets here. If you believe that it's been a wonderful convocation lecture, can you put your hands together again? The Chairman, sir, the Vice Chancellor, the convocation lecturer, uh, other principal officers, they are seated. I want to appreciate, first of all, God Almighty for making it another wonderful outing as part of the 10th convocation of Redeemers University. It's been a wonderful day and the challenge has been wonderful. Um, before I will give the vote of 10, I first of all want to invite the convocation lecturer again to come to the podium joined by the chairman of council, joined by our mommy, uh, Oretayo, joined by the vice chancellor, joined by uh, the bossa, the registrar, the librarian, professors that are here, also the former uh, immediate past registrar, permit me, the wife of the vice chancellor, please come to the stage here, we want to take a picture, respectively. Can I please, the protocol, please, can you come?
Uh, thank you for that uh, interlude. During the course of the lecture, we have from people who also walked in into our midst. We have um, one of our partners in this university, Zenith Bank, ably represented by Mr. Asi Kadebayo and Mr. B.C. Ade Lekon. Please, uh, wherever you are, can you just wave your hands? Ah, thank you so much. Please, let's put our hands together for them. We have Chairman Ocean Youth Coalition, Babawale Olusolati. Thank you, you're welcome. We also have Inspector Ade Midun Ola Niyan, NSDC at the South Local Government Area. Where are you? Thank you so much for coming. Um, Mr. Chairman, sir, we have also our friends, our media friends. They are here to cover this event. We have uh, Daily Post representative, Mr. Olani Yajibola here. Soji Adeniyi, The Nation. Wale Ige, Tribune. Richard Akitide, Nigerian pilot. Adeolu Adeyemon, New Telegraph. Please, let's encourage them by putting our hands together. Victor Adeolu Nan, Tululope Faleye Adaba FM. Abbas Okan Deji, MITV, Rafiu Ahmed, TVC, Adeni Yifolono Shol, on TV, Kamal Jamil, MITV, Wasiu Ajadosu, Radio Nigeria, Taiwo Aldo, TVC. Uh, so that tells you that this program is going to the media straight away. And I'm happy to also inform you that we are live streaming this program, so the whole world is actually seeing and listening to what is happening in this hall this afternoon. I hope we'll be excited with that. Uh, once again, can we put our hands together, especially the graduating student, can you put your, your hands together for yourself if you are here? Uh, I've never seen a set as lucky as this set. I thought that oh, would be louder than that. This set of students had the privilege of having a meeting with that geo right in his office. Right in his office. And I can see the... the advice given to them more or less pointing towards the same thing. 